Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brent Cotter. I'm a professor at the College of Law at the University of Saskatchewan and a senator in the Canadian Senate. Today, on behalf of the Speakers Committee at the College of Law, I'd like to welcome you to the fourth and final episode of our series, Re-Envisioning Policing in Canada. This event is sponsored uh, by the McCurcher Lecture Series, the McCurcher Law Firm in Saskatoon has been a major supporter of the lecture series at the College of Law for many years. As we gather virtually today, I acknowledge that I'm on Treaty 6 ter territory in the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respect to First Nation and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. I'd like to begin by thanking McCurcher LLP for sponsoring the lecture series. This event looks a little different, I think, this series of events. Uh, online and virtual as it is, but we promise the topics will not only be informative and educational, but we think relevant to what's happening in the world today. David Stack, QC, is a partner in the Saskatoon office where he practices a wide range of areas of law and has been a friend of the College of Law for many years. We have recorded remarks from David and I'll turn those over to you now, David. McCurcher LLP has had the privilege of being a proud supporter of this lecture series since its start in 2014. The decision to support the College of Law in these lectures was an easy one for us, as we understand firsthand the great job that the College does in educating and preparing successful lawyers. Education, knowledge and innovation are crucial in securing the future success of our province. Our support for this initiative provides a catalyst for provoking thought, enhancing collaboration, and engaging future leaders. With the transition of these lectures to the virtual format, we hope that this will provide an even greater opportunity for the College of Law to enlighten and engage students, lawyers, and our community on these important topics. Stay safe, be well, and enjoy. Today, I'm joined by uh, Professor Kent Roach, a professor of law and the Pritchard Wilson Chair of Law and Public Policy at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law, and a friend. Kent is also a former Dean of the College of Law at the University of Saskatchewan. He's a graduate of the University of Toronto and Yale Law School and a former law clerk to Madam Justice Bertha Wilson of the Supreme Court of Canada. Professor Roach has been the Editor-in-Chief of the Criminal Law Quarterly since 1998. In 2002, he was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, a very distinguished honour, and he was awarded the Molson Prize for Science, Social Sciences and Humanities in 2017. He has also served as Volume Lead for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report on the legacy of residential schools, He's been a member of Canadian Council of Academies, Ac Academies expert panels on policing and subsequently on Indigenous policing and has become a well-regarded expert in this field. He is currently research director for the Independent Civilian Re of Review of Missing Persons Investigations. With that, I turn it over to Professor Roach. Hello, it is a great honor to be part of this lecture series on re-envisioning policing in Canada. I thank the College of Law, uh, Senator Cotter, and the McCurcher firm uh, for making this uh, possible. Any discussion of policing in Canada uh, must reflect on the events of this summer, and in particular, the events of uh, in June of this summer. Uh, it was, uh, uh, time that made it very clear that uh, policing in Canada uh, uh, has to change uh, and that the issues that we see in the United States in light of the killing of George Floyd uh, uh, are also uh, to some degree present in Canada. So in June uh, 2020, uh, we saw within a few days the, the killings in New Brunswick of two Indigenous people, Chantal Moore during a wellness check, Rodney Levy during a complaint uh, about uh, staying at his pastor's house, 
Uh, later that month, uh, we saw the killing of Ijaz Chowdhury, a 62-year-old South Asian a man uh, who did not speak English. Again, uh, mental health uh, issues. And of course, uh, we had the dash cam video of Chief Alan Adam uh, and uh, the subsequent dropping of uh, police charges uh, against him. And in Toronto, uh, the assault conviction of Constable Theriot uh, for injuring uh, DeFonte um, Miller. Now, what these events uh, reveal are the issues of over-policing uh, that often make headlines and uh, command uh, attention. So these are issues of uh, police killings, uh, injuries of people, and overly aggressive uh, policing, uh, particularly in the context of mental health. Uh, but we also know in Canada that the same communities, the Indigenous communities, Black communities, uh, those living with mental uh, health issues, uh, also suffer uh, from what is sometimes called pol under-policing. Uh, now, of course, uh, we know this in Canada uh, through the work of the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry. Uh, before that, uh, the um, uh, uh, inquiry arising from uh, Picton's um, serial killing. And in Toronto, an ongoing review that is examining uh, the uh, Toronto Police's conduct in relation to the serial killer, uh, George MacArthur, who preyed on racialized uh, gay men. Uh, and we also know, um, uh, and I think it is a testament to, in some ways, the ineffectiveness of policing, that when Chief Mark Saunders of the Toronto Police Service, uh, the first Black uh, chief in Toronto retired, um, one of his departing comments was that he wanted to do something about young Black men killing young Black men. Uh, so both this phenomena of over and under policing is hardly new in Canada. Um, you can see it in the Manitoba Aboriginal Justice Inquiry that looked on the one hand, uh, the over policing that led to the death of J.J. Harper and the under policing that led to the delays uh, and uh, partial um, um, uh, convictions in, with respect to the death of a young Cree woman, Helen, Helen Betty Osborne. Uh, it was also seen in early work on the James Bay Cree that uh, the famed uh, uh, and late Canadian police scholar Jean, Pro, Jean Paul Bourdieu uh, also looked at how the Cree suffered both over policing uh, with respect to uh, some matters and under policing with respect to issues like domestic and sexual violence. Now, what relates uh, over and under policing? Uh, it seems like it is bad relationships with the communities being policed, often uh, fueled uh, by either conscious or unconscious uh, negative stereotypes about the people, uh, the, the communities being police that see them as either uh, more prone to criminality uh, and basically less worth, uh, worth, worth less uh, than uh, those people in uh, dominant uh, white society. Uh, so it seems to me that although we've known this uh, for at least 30 years, uh, the events of uh, June uh, 2020, which came one after another, really confirms that there is long systemic raci racism in Canada, and it is one of the most pressing challenges, not only in Canadian policing, but in Canadian society. And it's that balance between policing and society. Uh, that I will discuss uh, throughout this lecture, um, and I will um, reflect upon uh, some of the origins of policing, uh, what is good, what is bad, 
Uh, and then I hope to end uh, by talking to you about some very specific uh, proposals about possible changes that can be made at various levels of policing, the RCMP, contract policing, the provincial police forces in those provinces that they exist, and the municipal um, police forces. Uh, but first I want to start with some um, kind of basic uh, data and assumptions. Um, the first one is that police costs uh, are not uh, sustainable. Uh, I think they were not sustainable before uh, the COVID-19 crisis, uh, but I think that as we hopefully emerge from this, uh, we're going to see uh, depressed government revenues and spending uh, for quite some time. So what you see here is a graph uh, the, from uh, a Juristat uh, in 2018 uh, that uh, examines uh, policing costs. And you'll see that um, the um, um, a dark blue is current dollars. So obviously we've gone from spending about $150 uh, per person in, uh, in Canada on, uh, on uh, policing uh, to just under 400 uh, from 1987 to 2018. Um, now, of course, uh, bearing, in, bearing inflation, although of course some people uh, um, wages are not keeping up with inflation, uh, uh, it has still increased quite dramatically. And so <clears throat> the Canadian police uh, were largely sheltered uh, from the 2018 recession uh, compared to the American police, uh, the Australian police, and the British police. And I don't think that that will happen this time, uh, regardless of how debates, which we will discuss later, about defunding of the police uh, go, uh, go ahead. Uh, the other figure that you may have heard, which I think is quite important to bear in mind, is that uh, the average salary, uh, not counting overtime, not counting paid leave, of a police officer in Canada is uh, just under $100,000. Uh, so uh, the police are trained uh, professionals. Uh, we should respect them uh, as trained professionals. But one of the themes uh, in this lecture is that we should also discipline them and fire them uh, uh, as trained uh, professionals. And one of the problems here is that although policing has gotten very expensive uh, and uh, more complex, uh, we still have a horse and buggy um, system of discipline uh, that basically treats uh, police as if uh, they were soldiers. Uh, and um, that's obviously not the role uh, that they play, uh, nor uh, the role that we want them to play. Uh, now, adjusting police budgets are go is going to be a very, very difficult um, uh, um, issue. Uh, we've already seen the Toronto City Council uh, vote down a proposition for a limited 10% uh, budget cut. Um, the police, like so many of the organizations that we're familiar with, including universities, uh, are 80% are, are, uh, of the costs go to salaries and benefits. And so um, if there are hiring freezes, um, uh, which uh, uh, could see a huge turnover given that there are many police officers uh, who are of retirement age. Um, one of the issues may be that um, we will not be hiring uh, 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 um, uh, from a pool uh, that should be more diverse uh, than the current pool of policing, which um, with some exceptions is much less diverse uh, than uh, than um, uh, uh, Canadian 
uh, society. Um, we will also see um, uh, that there will be a real temptation uh, for police leaders and perhaps especially police unions or associations to argue that they should be exempted uh, from uh, cuts to the public sector uh, that I'm pretty sure are going to uh, emerge over the next uh, um, uh, decade. Now, of course, uh, sociologically, um, there is not a lot of support for that. Um, there's not a lot of support that the police activity actually does reduce crime uh, or that the police spend most of their time on uh, crime control activities. And of course, um, you know, one of the dangers of the defunding um, slogan uh, is uh, that it focuses simply on uh, on the police, where I think that uh, what activists and others um, really want from defunding is not simple defunding, but refunding. And that is uh, to uh, take more resources and devote it to social community and health uh, services. And one of the problems confronting policing is that policing exists in a kind of siloed uh, in environment uh, and uh, um, uh, we are not always spending uh, our, our uh, declining revenues in the most wise way uh, because policing is a very expensive intervention uh, compared to others aimed at housing, uh, mental health and addictions, um, education and so on, so on. Uh, but governments often don't have uh, the capacity uh, or the will uh, to make rational allocations uh, across agencies. Now, my approach to policing has been very much shaped by the fact that I've served on two expert panels appointed by the Canadian Council of Academies, which is probably not an institution that you've heard of. It wasn't an institution that I was aware of. But basically, um, the Canadian Council of Academies is designed to provide uh, the federal government uh, with expert advice uh, on issues that the federal government designates as important. And it writes reports, and the reports are available at this website uh, free of charge. Um, and the reports are not like a typical commission of inquiry or review report, as the experts are not allowed to make recommendations. But what they are allowed to do is to look at the state of evidence uh, about the topic that they are uh, examining. So typically these are scientific questions. Uh, one was done on, on the use of tasers, uh, but the two that I participated on was a 2014 report on policing and a 2019 report on uh, policing Indigenous communities. And so I'm very much influenced by the uh, um, uh, approach that was taken by uh, multidisciplinary experts. Uh, there were about 12 of us on each of the panels and with respect to the Indigenous communities panel, the majority on the panel uh, were Indigenous. Uh, that was chaired by Kim Murray uh, and the first policing panel was chaired by Justice Stephen Gouge. Um, and so one of the things I want to pick up uh, from this work is that in the 2014 report, uh, we talked about policing as part of a larger safety and security web. So this acknowledges that in Canada, there are um, uh, almost double the amount of people in private security and private policing as are in public policing. But it also gets across this idea that you see in hub models that if we are really concerned about safety, security, and well-being, we have to build in uh, the roles uh, with respect to uh, social services as well as community uh, resources. 
one of the other findings that we made is that policing is really built on an all-purpose constable model. You see this uh, uh, with respect to the RCMP. Everyone graduates from depot in Regina with certain skills. Um, and there's always going, or, or there may always be a need uh, for that 24-7 all-purpose resp response. Uh, but if you look at some of the challenges coming ahead, whether it's cybercrime or national security or issues involving uh, mental health and addictions, it's going to call for more specialization. Uh, and also generally uh, policing, and we were very much influenced by developments in the United Kingdom, uh, which I think in some respects are way ahead of where we are in Canada, uh, that policing needs to emerge uh, as more of a professional and evidence-based uh, 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 discipline. Now, the 2019 report of, uh, uh, on policing indigenous communities really stressed the need to decolonize policing uh, to reflect both indigenous self-government and indigenous law. And in some ways, it took a broader approach uh, with respect to not only being concerned about safety and, cons and security, but uh, well-being and a more holistic uh, sense of well-being. And uh, the 2019 report, I think, responding to uh, unfortunately well documented over and under policing of indigenous communities really focused on building strong relationships uh, within indigenous communities and between uh, those who police um, in indigenous communities. It also reflected on the fact that indigenous police forces uh, have themselves uh, uh, suffered from what can be seen as defunding. Uh, so the number of self-administered uh, Indigenous police forces has decreased dramatically uh, since the start of the First Nations policing program in 1991. I believe there was over 50 at the time. Now there are 36 in Saskatchewan. Uh, File Hills is the only self-administered uh, Indigenous uh, police uh, um, 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 service. So that's the, the focus on broader safety and well being, uh, I think, is one uh, that is accepted in some corners of policing, uh, but it is one that is certainly consistent with uh, most thinking and writing about policing. Now here, um, um, I want to add, uh, because obviously uh, I'm a criminal law, uh, criminal process scholar, uh, I also want to add um, another layer uh, that perhaps per, uh, speaks particularly uh, to law students and lawyers in the audience. Um, although we don't generally study policing, uh, um, as a um, entity in law school. Um, I think you know from uh, criminal procedure courses, uh, torts courses, administrative law courses, uh, that policing, policing is uh, heavily regulated. Now I say that not to defend that regulation and not to defend the police, but I do think that that is uh, something that we have to acknowledge. Um, um, uh, Christmas, uh, in his book, um, uh, who is uh, in the unique position of uh, being both a scholar and uh, a serving Winnipeg police officer, talked about um, quadruple jeopardy that police officers face. Now, again, I'm not saying this because I think police are victims of this, but I think that we have to acknowledge this as um, as a present reality, and one that has frankly not been able uh, to prevent uh, ongoing harms of under and over policing. Uh, so what are the elements of quadruple um, uh, uh, jeopardy as uh, Christmas um, defines it? 
Well, the first is uh, starting in Ontario, uh, we've had uh, what in Ontario is called the Special Investigations Unit or SIU. And uh, since uh, the early 1990s, this has been a recognition that uh, police uh, officers involved in deaths and serious injuries, as well as uh, allegations of sexual assault, uh, should not be investigated either by their own police force or by other uh, police forces. Uh, and many provinces uh, have, um, have adopted uh, this model, um, but frankly, the model um, has struggled. Um, the model has struggled uh, both with respect to uh, police cooperation uh, with independent investigators. Uh, so one of the issues in DeFonte Miller uh, that the Toronto Police have acknowledged uh, and apologized for is that um, uh, the SIU was not informed uh, for over a month uh, that one of their off-duty officers was involved in a very serious injury that left DeFonte Miller uh, without an eye. Um, so there are issues of police cooperation. Uh, uh, police uh, 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 are obviously experts uh, uh, in the law. Uh, they have police associations that generally pay for lawyers. So subject officers uh, generally lawyer up and assert their right to silence, which, um, you know, uh, given that they're facing possible criminal jeopardy, uh, is their right. Um, and there are low uh, uh, rates of charges and convictions. Now, I don't want to abandon the SIU model, uh, but I also think we shouldn't expect it to do too much. This is basically a minimum rule of law component, and um, uh, the various um, uh, special investigators created uh, don't always hold the confidence of marginalized communities. Uh, I think in part because of their per performance, uh, uh, low conviction rates, um, and uh, also because of, um, of um, using uh, former police officers who often have some of the expertise that is needed to uh, do an effective murder manslaughter investigation. We also have to realize that although police officers uh, are not above the, above the rule of law and that the SIU is a basic rule of law um, mechanism, that the rule of law allows um, um, uh, the police to plead self-defense and law enforcement uh, justification. And uh, in a recent book that I've written about uh, the Colton Bushy, uh, Gerald Stanley case, uh, I've raised uh, questions about whether we have expanded uh, our laws of self-defense um, uh, too far. Uh, and they certainly do allow um, 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 the um, uh, accused uh, in, in this uh, context, uh, the SIU context, the police officer, to effectively put a victim, uh, often a deceased victim, uh, on trial uh, in order to establish that they had uh, some reasonable basis uh, for fearing uh, that there is a use of force. Uh, so that's one layer of liability. Um, I think it is important, uh, but I also think that um, it doesn't, uh, um, that it often fails at the individual level, and then also um, does not always lead to systemic changes. So one of the things that I don't see coming from SIU investigations and prosecutions are changes to police use of force uh, policy. Uh, so in many cases, um, we see a disturbing and recurring pattern, and that is a uh, person with mental health issues who has a knife uh, being shot by the police. And although I'm not a police professional, um, I do 
uh, worry about that from a public policy perspective, even though uh, we are devoting um, significant resources to independent investigations. Now, if there is not a, a basis for a criminal charge, uh, a police officer can still be charged uh, under uh, various codes of officer conduct uh, that relate to discipline. Uh, but again, um, these systems are um, really quite arch archaic. So the adjudicator in many instances is a uh, sitting or a retired uh, police, uh, uh, senior police officer. Uh, uh, and the penalties are often things like days off, uh, being, being a, a, a financial um, um, penalty. Um, the discipline process, in part because of the availability of lawyers uh, through associations, police associations uh, has become long and complex and very legalistic. And at the end of the day, uh, the penalties uh, often uh, strike the public as uh, quite trivial. Uh, uh, in almost all forces, uh, police will uh, receive pay while they are awaiting discipline and termination, although possible through the police discipline process is actually quite rare. Uh, so a recent review of uh, public uh, mounting uh, disciplines uh, shows that even uh, some uh, who are found uh, to engage in sexual harassment or, or even things like sexual assault are not necessarily removed. Um, then we have civil liability um, and Canada has a fairly expansive uh, regime of civil liability. Uh, towards a negligent investigation, uh, obviously civil liability relating uh, to police deaths. Uh, but again, um, what we don't see is uh, an overall uh, uh, a loop uh, through, the, through to um, uh, policing policy. I think the same is true of charter reviews uh, in uh, Ontario. There has been a recent report uh, called Breaking the Golden Rule in reference to the 2001 case that limited strip search, which shows uh, fairly chronic uh, especially among the Toronto Police Service, uh, uh, violations of Golden. Uh, but again, uh, the policy loop uh, 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 into changes is um, not always clear. Uh, one of the things that I think Parliament should do, and this was actually part of the Golden uh, decision, where the majority in that case called for Parliament to regulate uh, strip searches. And I believe that a lot of police practices, including investigative detentions, uh, could be better regulated by Parliament. Uh, Parliament does respond uh, to some court decisions, but really only where the court says you can't do this unless there's a new warrant procedure. And in Golden, the court did not go that far. So we have lots to change. Uh, but I have to say that as someone who is quite interested in history um, and uh, is not a police abolitionist, um, I do look to history uh, to find uh, some things uh, that perhaps we can build on. Uh, and also some things to respond to uh, what I fear is a growing polarization between the police and the community. Um, I don't think that this is in anyone's long-term interest. And I think that we obviously live in polarized, uh, violent and scary times, uh, but we need to uh, think about uh, uh, where we might have common ground. And fortunately in Canada, I think we do have uh, some possible common ground. Um, now, obviously, here um, speaking to you from, uh, or I, I, I'm speaking to you who are on Treaty Six um, ter territory. Um, we have to start with the treaties, 
and uh, the treaty provisions about maintaining uh, peace and good order, uh, as uh, Professor Henderson and uh, Professor Burroughs and others have uh, written eloquently about, are really about uh, indigenous communities um, uh, using their own methods, their own kind of multidisciplinary uh, um, um, well-being based methods to maintain uh, peace and good order. And Harold Johnston's um, most recent book, I think speaks most eloquently to this, where uh, after going through all of the failings of the Canadian criminal justice system really looks to uh, the treaties and indigenous law uh, as um, uh, something that um, could be better and, and, and probably could not be worse. Um, but I also take seriously the aid and assistance uh, part of uh, that clause. And I also think that um, we have, uh, we being uh, non-Indigenous uh, Canadians, can learn uh, from uh, um, Indigenous methods of uh, peacekeeping and good order. And I don't think that it is a coincidence that the hub model of policing uh, was developed in Prince Albert uh, in Saskatchewan. Um, so obviously the treaties are a very complex topic, um, but I do think that they should be acknowledged. The other thing I think should be acknowledged is Sir Robert Peel's uh, principles. And not many people, I mean, most people have heard of Peel, uh, but have probably, you know, heard of him in, in reference to the idea that the police is the public. And I think that um, many people might dismiss that uh, because the police don't look like the public. They don't look like the public in the way that they're dressed the way that they're armed, uh, and also in their composition. Um, but that's only part of what Peel uh, um, was doing. Uh, Peel was involved in the creation of the London Met Force, which we're going to talk about. And he really was trying to convince a skeptical public to accept the need for public police and to distinguish them from a paramilitary organizations that were used in the continent in Europe and in a colonial way in, Ire in, in Ireland. So one of Peel's principles was that the ability of the police to perform their duties depends upon public approval. Uh, so he recognized the need for legitimacy. He also recognized the need for restraint or what today would be called de-escalation. He also talked about how the London Met or the police that he envisioned would uh, uh, be absolutely impartial. And so uh, um, in today's law, uh, 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 updated to today's context, this means that they must respect rights, including equality rights. And then um, uh, again, the issue of restraints. So I'm not saying that either the treaties or, or Peel's models uh, provide a detailed recipe, but I do think that they can provide uh, some inspiration. And I think that they're also relevant because many of the Canadian police forces that we are familiar with, the RCMP, the Alberta and Saskatchewan Provincial Police, before they were abolished, were really based not on Peel's model of policing, uh, but uh, the Irish constabulary uh, paramilitary uh, model of policing. And so here you see uh, some early pictures of the Mounties, um, the Redcoats, uh, looking very much like the military, uh, carrying weapons and having a kind of military sort of uh, uh, dress. Um, and here on, uh, on uh, the left side, um, you see uh, the London Bobbies, who are dressed differently. 
um, kind of a top hat, very similar to what the public would be wearing, and they're uh, sitting there enjoying a smoke. Uh, so, you know, quite a kind of different sort of model. And I think that if, if we kind of go back to the future and we think of the Mounties especially as still based on a kind of paramilitary model, um, uh, that is not subject to uh, the same demands for public legitimacy. And in the indigenous context, if we also see uh, the RCMP as based on a colonial model of the type that was used in Ireland, uh, where the police uh, were uh, basically uh, just a little bit short of an occupying military force, that one of the uncompleted um, um, tasks uh, is to fully uh, civilianize or peelize uh, uh, the uh, uh, RCMP and other uh, um, um, uh, uh, other uh, forces that follow uh, the power, paramilitary and in some respects increasingly mil, mil, militarized uh, model. So in the remainder of my lecture, uh, what I'm going to do is throw out uh, some perhaps more concrete uh, proposals or ideas uh, about how uh, policing should be re-envisioned. Uh, because I think it is very important, uh, and this is why I applaud the College of Law uh, for having uh, this series. I think it is very important that we move on this momentum. Because although uh, the last few months, uh, uh, in some ways, has not revealed anything new in terms of over and under policing, it has, uh, I think, generated a potential uh, for real change. So let's start off with the RCMP. Uh, can it be truly civilianized? So the RCMP, if you read the RCMP Act, is you know, very much a kind of top-down model. So um, the Minister of Public Safety uh, is in charge. Uh, but as you know, the Minister of Public Safety has an incredibly busy portfolio uh, dealing with issues of national security, border security, corrections, uh, and frankly, um, uh, successive ministers of public safety uh, have not been overly active uh, in terms of providing at least public and transparent uh, governance uh, to the RCMP. And then uh, the commissioner, uh, so a very centralized model, uh, the commissioner uh, is effectively in charge, although she is subject to the direction of the minister of public safety. And then it goes down uh, through the various uh, divisions, uh, which again, you know, I think contrary to Peel's idea of the public as police, the divisions are named after letters. So it's almost like, you know, E troop, a troop, uh, uh, although it is called divisions, but you see that it is uh, quite uh, militaristic. Um, and some uh, proposals uh, have been made. Uh, Professor uh, Luprecht uh, from the Royal Military College uh, has made a proposal that, you know, maybe the RCMP uh, can learn from the Canadian forces and should move to uh, the sort of model uh, that is used to govern uh, the Canadian forces. Uh, in my own view, uh, that would be a serious mistake. Uh, and I say that because uh, policing, uh, especially on either the treaty or the Peel model, is localized. Uh, it is about uh, uh, the local administration of justice. And so, although I don't doubt that there could be some internal management improvements uh, if perhaps uh, the RCMP was governed in Ottawa more like the Department of National Defense, I think that that would remove uh, the connection with the local community. Now, I do think, though, that the RCMP uh, is going to have to change. 
And the reason why I say that is uh, borrowing uh, uh, from uh, the economist Albert Hirschman, uh, uh, obviously as a prof at the U University of Toronto, uh, we're known more for our law, law and economics. Uh, uh, and Hirschman uh, came up in 1970 with this uh, very intriguing um, and fairly simple idea that whether you're dealing with uh, markets uh, um, or uh, political or economic organizations, that consumers have um, uh, a couple of different choices. Uh, if they're not happy, in this case with the RCMP, they can exit, right? And we're seeing just this in Surrey. So Surrey, as you know, is a very large and growing suburb of Toronto, uh, of, of Toronto sorry, um, the whole world revolves around Toronto, I know, um, of Vancouver, uh, and uh, is policed by an RCMP detachment of about 800 officers. Uh, and about uh, a few years ago, uh, the Surrey Council uh, gave notice uh, that as of March of next year, 2021, they're going to create their own police force. Uh, and they're well, well on their way uh, to creating their own police force. So they now have what they didn't have under the RCMP, which is a board of uh, governance, a police board that is chaired by the elected mayor of Surrey, and has um, provincial appointees, uh, provincial appointees uh, representing local indigenous communities, the South Asian community, and so forth. And so I think that this exit option from contract policing is something that we frankly shouldn't be afraid of. Um, now, there are some financial costs and there are some transition costs. And right now, in a large uh, center like Surrey, the federal government subsidizes contract policing, although at a much lower rate than it used to, 15% of the budget for the RCMP uh, in Surrey is taken up uh, by uh, uh, Ottawa but the rest is essentially paid for by Surrey. And so I think that what Surrey is doing is saying, look, if we're paying police and we're paying more, uh, we want to have more control over our police. And the Surrey um, um, uh, has a, a almost 200 page plan for their new police force. And one of the striking things through the plan, I don't have time to go into it in detail, is you know, there are parts of the plan that I frankly disagree with. There are parts that I think are good, but it's there and transparent in a way that the Mounties have not been. And indeed, the only redacted parts of the 200 um, uh, 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 page plan for the Surrey police are details on the existing RCMP detachment. So, you know, again, this idea of secrecy uh, may make sense in some contexts, may make sense with respect to the military, but I don't think makes sense for a, uh, a uh, truly civilized, uh, 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 a civilian police force. Uh, and so um, what Surrey gains from the exit is they get a voice and they get a voice that they don't really, that they didn't think that they had with the RCMP. Now, I think that contract policing could continue, and I don't think it's realistic to say, poof, contract policing is gone in the three territories and eight provinces where it exists. Uh, but I think if it is going to continue, the RCMP and the federal government has to uh, be serious and perhaps amend the RCMP Act to allow more local governance. And here, the best example that I found is the Yukon Police Council. And the Yukon Police Council was created uh, in part to instruct the RCMP in 
uh, in uh, the Yukon. It, 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 it has, uh, I believe, six people, three appointed uh, from First Nations, three appointed from government, including uh, very high uh, civil ser servants. Now, obviously, you know, one of the issues is going to be the degree that there can be local governance of a large hierarchical organization. And um, again, there's not a lot of transparency about how to, revol to, to uh, uh, um, resolve those conflicts between what RCMP in Ottawa or Out of Depot produces and what uh, the policing council in Yukon wants the RCMP to do. So the degree of voice that local communities will have in contract policing, I think is an open question. Uh, but I do think that uh, all other things being equal, uh, the ability to exit uh, or to threaten to exit uh, 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 may have a, an impact. And although there are 20 year contracts signed on contract policing, uh, they can, uh, uh, provinces uh, can, and territories can withdraw from them uh, with a few years notice. And so again, this, this, this has been uh, 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 the Surrey experience. Now compare Yukon with Nunavut. And Nunavut has been in the news uh, recently. Uh, you probably all saw um, the man being knocked down uh, by an open RCMP cruiser door. Um, what you may not know is that that man was also uh, uh, then uh, assaulted uh, by a fellow prisoner when he was detained uh, for intoxication um, and uh, uh, suffered injuries that were so serious that he had to be flown to Iqaluit uh, to receive medical treatment. Uh, so uh, Nunavut really, um, you know, things have to change. Um, and uh, uh, Nunavut is also uh, one of the few jurisdictions where they don't have an SIU, so it's the Ottawa police that come in to do any independent investigations. And uh, uh, just this morning, uh, there uh, 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 there are concerns about the trans tran uh, uh, transparency of that process. Now, um, you might think, well, um, you know, if there are more and more Surreys, more and more exits, uh, you know, what happens to the RCMP? And what happens to uh, the loyalty that many Canadians feel uh, towards the RCMP? Uh, I think it's important to know that the RCMP uh, still plays a very important role in what Jean-Paul Bourdieu called high crime, which includes national security, corporate crime, cyber crime, um, that kind of specialized um, sorts of crime. It could also offer uh, police services or, or services, forensic and other services to other police forces that have exited. So, you know, one of the things that Surrey is going to do is that they're going to continue in order to be cost effective or to try to be cost effective to share some services both with the RCMP and Vancouver uh, Paul, Paul Lees. And so I think that um, an RCMP that has less contract policing uh, might actually be uh, a better RCMP. I also think though that the Minister of Public Safety needs to step up. I was part of the advisory commission uh, committee uh, for Justice O'Connor's inquiry into the activities of Canadian officials in relation to Mayor Arar. And one of the things that that commission found was that the RCMP was not adequately trained for the national security duties that they assumed after 9-11, that that contributed to Mr. Arar's torture in Syria. And Justice O'Connor urged that the Minister of Public Safety use public ministerial directives 
in order to guide uh, the RCMP and to ensure uh, proper central control. Now, you know, one of the disturbing things is that, that report came out in 2006. There is still, to my knowledge, no public repository of ministerial directives that have been issued by the public, the Minister of Public Safety. I currently have an access to information requests in, uh, but I think that there is no reason why there should not be a ministerial directive about policing policies like the Mr. Big uh, operation, uh, like use of force, like investigative stops. And I think that those sorts of policies have a potential to prevent abuses before they happen. Whereas the quadruple liability of existing accountability mechanisms really relies on ex post accountabilities, sometimes strong remedies like stays of proceedings uh, or, or collapse of prosecutions, but with no guarantee that the force will take remedial action in order to prevent uh, those um, um, uh, abuses from occurring again. Uh, and I think the Minister of Public Safety in the future has to step up because if he or she does not step up, then with the new union, uh, which is, has overwhelmingly support among our CMP rank and file, who are very disenchanted by a number of things, including their pay, uh, uh, their postings, uh, uh, um, and, and, and mental health issues, uh, the harassment issues, um, that the union uh, is going to be the largest police union uh, in, in Canada, probably one of the largest in the world. And uh, when there is a policy vacuum, uh, then there is a danger that the union will fill that. And certainly some municipal police forces have seen uh, police unions really engage on issues of policing policy. And that's one of the reasons why, although it's been a personal kind of pet uh, project of mine as an academic, and there's always a danger that um, we think that they're more, that th those are personal pet projects are more important than they actually are. I actually think that, again, following both the Arar and Epperwash inquiries, that the RCMP should define police independence, which I conceive as quite a narrow, that we don't want the Minister of Public Safety to tell the RCMP who to investigate or who not to investigate. But other than that, I have no problems. I see no problems in the Minister of Public Safety assuming responsibility for things like use of force, public protest uh, policies, Mr. Big policies, etc. I certainly see that it may be a political liability for a Minister of Public Safety or any elected official to do so. And I think that that's political shirking is one of the real democratic problems confronting policing, uh, but I don't see why that should not be done. Uh, I also think that as the RCMP and other police forces uh, have to uh, uh, deal with cuts uh, that I think all of us in the public service are going to suffer over the next decade, they may have to think about, and again, unions are going to have something to say about this, taking positions that are currently done by armed sworn officers and transferring them to civilians. Uh, you know, traffic, for example, uh, bylaws. Um, I don't think there's a lot of reason why this has to be done by an armed uh, police officer. Although I do recognize that in Saskatchewan, and, and I'm concerned about it, as I think some other people are, that conservation bylaw officers have recently been armed. But arming someone is really, really expensive. So the estimate in arming uh, the, uh, the cost of 6,000 uh, Canadian Border Service uh, uh, people has been uh, uh, about uh, uh, almost 700 million dollars. So again, I think civilianization uh, and using more unarmed community safety officers um, it, um, has some potential. Another thing that needs to be done 
is to reform the RCMP's legalistic and slow discipline uh, process. Uh, as I suggested earlier, uh, my review of recent public uh, decisions uh, decided uh, suggests that there are you know, fairly low penalties. Uh, I think I read one recently where there was 30 days off uh, or you know, 30 days pay subtracted for what was essentially a sexual assault. And I compared that with 20 days that were taken off uh, for an RCMP officer who used his own loyalty card uh, when filling up his cruiser. Uh, and so I would hope that enlightened union leaders uh, wouldn't just resist any change to the discipline process, because it seems to me that uh, you know, 20 and 30 days, uh, uh, one for a trivial issue, one for an extremely serious issue, there really is something out of whack. Uh, and of course, uh, RCMP officers suffer uh, from long delays in uh, discipline processes. Um, and um, um, I think that, you know, something um, has to change. Uh, the other thing that really has to change in the proroguing of Parliament uh, provides an opportunity is that the government needs to go back to the drawing board with Bill C-3, which would have taken the existing RCMP uh, complaints body, which last time I checked has a budget of 11 million uh, compared to a $3 billion uh, budget for the RCMP. Uh, Bill C-3 would have given uh, that body additional duties with respect to the Canadian Border Service agency. But the problem is, is it doesn't have the resources to do its, its own existing duties with respect to the RCMP. And we know that the RCMP is sitting on many of its reports. Uh, and in fact, uh, Commissioner Lucky, when she testified uh, 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 before Parliament was prorogued, said that she had uh, the uh, uh, Colton Bushy, Debbie Batiste uh, 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 a complaint uh, sitting on her desk. Um, she had read it, uh, but it would not be released until uh, this, 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 this fall. Uh, so there's a lot that needs to be changed with the RCMP. Um, I'm somewhat cautiously optimistic, if only because I think that there is less reflexive loyalty uh, than there used to be with respect to the RCMP. Um, it's been one scandal after another, uh, and uh, there are options uh, both uh, to either assert voice or to exit and obtain more voice, at least from contract policing. But I do think that we need the Minister of Public Safety as the democratic link with respect to the RCMP uh, to step up and, uh, and uh, take more responsibility for uh, policing policy uh, in the RCMP minus the um, a very limited realm of law enforcement discretion and independence. Now, provincial uh, forces uh, may seem less uh, relevant uh, to an audience in Saskatchewan, um, and I don't want to focus too much, obviously, on Ontario, but Alberta, uh, perhaps BC, perhaps Saskatchewan uh, may one day go back uh, to having their own uh, own uh, provincial police forces. And Ontario's Police Service Act that was passed by the Wynn government in 2017, but it's still not been fully proclaimed in force by the new Ford government, uh, although not perfect, uh, does provide for uh, some forms of voice. So it provides for uh, uh, both uh, uh, governance boards for detachments of the OPP and uh, First Nation boards when the OPP provides policing as they do in many uh, First Nations communities who have not been able to fund their own self-administered uh, um, um, forces. Uh, but again, the tension that I identified with the RCMP 
is there because the OPP, like the RCMP, is governed in a top-down way from the minister to the um, 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 commissioner. One of the most disappointing things in the 2017 Ontario legislation is that it did not uh, adopt uh, Justice Linden's recommendations in the Ipperwash inquiry. And again, uh, I disclosed that I was part of the advisory uh, committee for that in inquiry to define uh, police independence in a limited way and to promote democratic government in the form of public directives between the minister and the um, uh, OPP. Many people thought that because of the Ipperwash focus on whether uh, Mike Harris uh, played a role in the militarized um, uh, confrontation at Ipperwash that led to the death of Dudley George, um, uh, 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 a man defending um, his land. Um, um, uh, I think many thought that because there was much focus on whether there was political direction that Justice Linden kind of, you know, defined police independence broadly. Uh, he did not. Um, Justice Linden said what was important was that any democratic direction to the police come through the responsible minister, not from the center, not from a ministerial aid or the premier's aid, uh, and that it be written down and presumptively be made public. Uh, and Andrew Sankton, a political scientist, has found uh, much uh, that, that he thought commendable in that model of democratic policing. But again, uh, Professor Sankton, in the context of Caledonia, uh, uh, raises the danger of political shirking, that elected politicians too often have an incentive to say, well, we're just going to leave this to the police. We don't want to set the rules of the um, debate. Um, the Ontario Act also has some, uh, I think, quite needed reforms to the discipline process, more of a professional independent tribunal, uh, and also uh, a very limited uh, suspension without pay, only if there's criminal convictions or bail conditions that would prevent the person from policing. So again, you know, unlike in the United States, where you've seen the officers involved in George Floyd's um, 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 killing rather summar summarily dismissed, uh, as I think is appropriate, um, that's much harder in Canada. And then finally, uh, what should we do at the municipal level? In some ways, uh, I think this, this is where the promise, the Pelian promise uh, of democratic policing uh, is probably most likely. And in Ontario, there have been some attempts to strengthen the governing boards, uh, both to make them more diverse, but also more knowledgeable. Because one of the problems is that um, the, 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 the governing boards, and, and they're not full-time governors, uh, it usually involves the mayor. So Mayor Tory sits on the Toronto Police Service Board. Uh, he's obviously a very busy person. That there's a concern that the police chief really holds the bow, balance of power. And especially when the province has adequacy standards. So one of the reasons that was given uh, for not imposing arbitrary cuts on the Toronto police was the need to maintain provincial adequacy standards. Um, that said, again, I mean, perhaps I'm unduly pessimistic, but having lived through too many recessions, I think not, we're going to see our arbitrary cuts in all public service uh, once we start coming out of the COVID uh, 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 emergency. I note that in Saskatoon, there's been recent expansion of the police board um, that allows it to be more representative, but there also has to be training and experience. I also read some uh, results that were online about a public uh, opinion poll that was done in Saskatoon about 
um, uh, 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 investigative detentions uh, and street checks, uh, it showed a lot of support for the police. So we also have to, you know, acknowledge the fact that democratic policing uh, in a society uh, where uh, minorities are minorities uh, may not necessarily be, be uh, anti-racist. So I think what we need is a form of structured democracy. I think police service boards need to have their own uh, legal advice uh, about what is um, um, uh, 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 allowed and what is not allowed. And then finally, or, or, or almost finally, um, um, I want to, to, to add this idea that all levels of government should use their spending powers in order to promote um, uh, a range of safety and well-being projects. And these may involve the police, they may not. Uh, they should use community expertise. They should build in evaluation not simply for the sake of giving academics work or, or other evaluators, but there should be a road to secure funding. So for, for example, uh, the 15% that the federal government uh, uh, provides and, and, and in remote areas lar larger, uh, some of that money, if there is a withdrawal from contract policing, should be used uh, uh, to allow competitive bid bidding for uh, community safety and well-being projects. And I think, you know, again, the Saskatchewan experience with the FSIN starting their own kind of SIU and then that eventually being uh, uh, part of the larger police oversight apparatus in Saskatchewan uh, serves as a uh, as as a potential example. Uh, similarly, things like the Bear Clan uh, and other community groups, I think we need to look at these as perhaps uh, offering uh, better uh, or supplementary uh, uh, um, um, services. I think, frankly, some of the challenge will be in the next decade finding the money uh, to uh, to uh, to have uh, those sort, sort, so, sorts sorts of, of of projects, and then finally, um, um, I also, as a criminal justice scholar, uh, have to um, uh, call attention to law reform. As you know, we haven't really decriminalized sex work. Um, um, uh, drugs, uh, uh, maybe even traffic. Um, and if that was done, uh, then um, that would uh, change uh, the way that policing is done. And, you know, finally, I just kind of want to reflect that policing scholars like Bittner and Brodeur have always said, well, the police, what really distinguishes them is the use of force. And I just want to end with a kind of personal story. Uh, fairly early in my career, uh, before I had kids and all that, uh, I spent uh, probably too many weekends riding around in the back of squad cars in Niagara Falls, Ontario, and Niagara Falls, New York. And one of my biggest conclusions and was written up uh, was that because the American police had so many different cruisers, especially on Friday and Saturday nights. It meant a lot more investigative detention, proactive policing, obviously effects on black populations. It also meant that whenever there was an action call, you often had two, three, four cruisers and a kind of dynamic uh, that could quickly go south. Uh, on the Canadian side, uh, which actually was policing a much larger area, there were at most six, seven cruisers, uh, often just one person uh, cruisers. And, 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 and this led to a much more uh, reactive form of policing. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, a story that has been making its root in uh, the United States is the story of Gainesville's uh, famous or infamous basketball cop. Uh, so this was a police officer 
who uh, before George Floyd was, um, was um, uh, hailed uh, and actually met uh, Shaquille O'Neal uh, because uh, he played basketball with people when he was responding to a uh, noise uh, uh, complaint. Uh, he then set up his own kind of community group uh, and apparently did a lot of good to the community. Uh, subsequently, uh, this video was captured of him uh, uh, arresting uh, a person, uh, a young black man, uh, at a traffic stop. Um, uh, there eventually were no charges. Um, one of the people that the officer helped, uh, a young black man in Gainesville, uh, when he was asked to look at this video, simply said, you know, uh, I think there's a video like that for every police officer. It's what they're taught. And I think that in some ways, there's a lot of wisdom in that young man's uh, uh, streetwise ob observation. So, you know, if I leave you with anything, it is that the police need to change. They're going to be with us. They need to change. They can change. But more than that, uh, our society needs to change. And our society needs to change in a way that recognizes the reality of racism and that deals with uh, structural inequalities, which are giving the police more and more issues to deal with that they're never going to be trained to deal with. The police are never going to be experts on mental health, experts on, on drug addiction. And we have to somehow create the space for those better ways to contribute to safety and well-being. I'm really sorry that I can't be with you in person. Uh, I very much um, 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 uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity, and I hope that um, um, if there's any reactions, you can send me an email uh, and that I will hear it. And I also look forward to listening to the other lectures in what I hope is going to be an important uh, series that can lead to real and necessary change in Canadian policing. Thank you very much. Meg Wedge. Thank you, Kent, and thank you to everyone for tuning in. This concludes our special series, Re-Envisioning Policing in Canada. We hope that this series of lectures has provided you with a better picture of the challenges faced by police, between citizens and police, and particularly the challenges faced by Indigenous Canadians and people from racialized communities. We've offered this hopefully to provide insights into the ways in which policing can be re-envisioned and improved, and the ways in which we can all contribute better to these improvements for the betterment of our communities and our country. If you missed any of these four episodes in the series, they are available on the YouTube page, and you can visit law.usask.ca to learn more. Thank you for tuning in. Have a good day.